So uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers for, you know, uh, giving me another chance to speak. And um, as I promised last week, the um, the talk was, uh, the plan was to give a talk on um, eyelid reconstruction and lip reconstruction, because those are two things that uh, we generally don't get to uh, see. So um, we have a brief presentation on eyelid reconstruction, and uh, then we have a slightly more detailed presentation on uh, lip reconstruction. So um, see, earlier, um, there are a wide variety of tumors that can affect the eyelids. You know, you can have starting from um, skin tumors, you can have mebobian gland tumors, you can have tumors of the conjunctiva or the mucosal surface, you can have tumors of the lacrimal apparatus, or you can have tumors that uh, are of the skin from the surrounding cheek, which have invaded the um, eyelid. So earlier, uh, before the advent of more surgery and cryosurgery, a lot of the eyelid surgeries used to be quite debilitating. And uh, it used to be full thickness resections of either the upper lid or the lower lid. So a lot of the eyelid reconstruction techniques have been described a long time ago, like, you know, 1950s and 60s, uh, is when the principles of eyelid reconstruction um, came to be. And nothing much has changed, actually. We still follow the same surgical techniques and principles that were described 30, 40 years ago. But uh, it, it is, it's always good to conceptualize uh, the reconstruction because you need to know what are the goals of reconstruction and how best to achieve them. So if you look at the uh, sagittal section of the uh, globe and the uh, eyelids, you can see that the eyelid is a, is a uh, complicated structure. Uh, you don't have um, it's not as simple as skin in the other areas because you have the skin, then you have the very sparse subcutaneous tissue, then you have the muscle, which is the orbicularis, uh, then you have the structural, um, uh, the, the, the structure that gives support to the lid, that is the tarsal plates, and then you have the levators of the lid, and then you have the uh, sling, which keeps the lower lid in place via the medial and canthal medial and lateral canthal ligaments. Now, for purposes of reconstruction, we have to divide the, uh, the reconstruction into the uh, structure of the uh, eyelid into two. That is the anterior lamella and the posterior lamella. The anterior lamella is the skin, the subcutaneous and the orbicularis muscle. And the posterior lamella is the tarsal plates and the conjunctiva. Now, no eyelid reconstruction is complete unless both the anterior and the posterior lamella are reconstructed. So the goals of this presentation is to understand the importance of reconstructing the anterior and posterior lamella, to focus on reconstruction of full thickness defects of the lid, to understand the local flaps that are available, and decide which flap to use depending on the size of the defect. Uh, after the initial description of these defects, there have been several modifications which exist in literature, but then uh, I've gone through the, uh, the modifications that have been described. But in a sense, if you know the original procedure quite well, you can uh, get away by doing a good eyelid reconstruction. So as I mentioned, the types of lid loss can be partial thickness, meaning in most common cases can be the skin and the orbicularis, preserving the structural integrity that is a tarsal plate. Or it can be full thickness, uh, like squamous cell carcinomas, which have uh, invaded through and through. And that is probably what we more commonly encounter in India compared to the um, BCCs that are seen in the West. <clears throat> now, what are the goals of reconstruction? <clears throat> you must have a smooth inner mucosal surface. Or rather, you should have a non-keratinized surface that is a substitute for the conjunctiva. You have to have good outer skin lining. You must reconstruct the structural support of the eyelid uh, by doing tarsal replacement. You should have a smooth non-abraded eyelid margin because if your eyelid margin is inverted or your eyelid margin is red and granulating, it can um, affect the cornea. You have to maintain normal vertical uh, height and movement of the upper lid, meaning 
uh, you have to reapproximate the levators, uh, mainly the levator and the Muller's muscle. And you have to ensure that you have normal medial and lateral canthal positions. And in the end, you should maintain good uh, globe contour. Now, usually for uh, partial thickness uh, losses, that is, uh, you have either the anterior lamella or the posterior lamella that has been resected, then you can use uh, static grafts because you have a vascular bed where you can place these static grafts. So if you lose the skin um, of the eyelid, uh, you can use a full thickness skin graft. And usually the post auricular skin is a good donor site for the um, skin graft. So if you have isolated skin defects, a full thickness skin graft does work. If you have conjunctival defects, isolated conjunctival defects, free mucosal grafts will work. Uh, there are different sources, buccal mucosa, nasal mucosa, but uh, we must remember that we cannot use skin as a lining for the conjunctiva because of the epithelial elements uh, and the keratin elements that are present in skin. If the structural uh, integrity or the tarsal plate is lost, uh, we can use cartilage grafts that can um, uh, you know, reconstruct the structural support. Now these cartilaginous grafts can be either simple cartilage or they can be uh, composite cartilage. That is, you can have cartilage with skin or you can just have cartilage with perichondrium. So you have different sources, nasal septum, chondrum mucosal grafts, upper lateral nasal, conchal grafts, and heart palate mucosal grafts. Now, heart palate mucosal grafts uh, do offer structural support because they're thick uh, and uh, they don't um, uh, deform. So they come under tarsal plate uh, replacements if you're planning to do a um, partial thickness repair with a graft. Now, if you place the graft, you always, always must have a um, well-vascularized bed. If you don't have a well-vascularized bed, then you're not going to have graft take. And you cannot use two static grafts, obviously, because that will never take as well. Now, there are some general principles in closure that we have to follow. Um, the important things are, um, the, it is always better to convert your defect, your through and through defect into a pentagonal defect, because that is what uh, makes it easier to close. And then there are a series of sutures that you have to take, uh, which include closure of the tarsal plate, closure of the lid margin and closure of the skin. So in principle, you approximate the posterior lamella separately, and then you approximate the skin and the um, and the lid margin separately. You don't do them through and through. So in the posterior lamella, when you're looking at a through and through defect, you the eyelid retractors are sutured first, and then you move on to the tarsal plate. Now the tarsal plate can be sutured with vicral stitches, but they should not be through and through bites because you don't want the suture to go through the conjunctiva and abrade the cornea. So it should be just through the tarsal plate and extra conjunctival. And um, you should never have any exposed uh, suture abrading on the cornea. Now, this is a simple example. Uh, so you have to make it a pentagonal defect. What we first do is to take a stay suture uh, just beneath the lid margin within the tarsus and we don't tie it. Uh, we suture the tarsal plate in a vertical mattress fashion or in a simple fashion. And uh, we don't tie the knots until all the sutures are placed, as you can see here. Once all the sutures are placed, then the knot is tied. And once the knot is tied, the lid the gray line of the lid. Now, these vertical mattress sutures are left long because the skin is then approximated with the running stitch and one end of the vertical mattress suture is sutured to this end of the running suture and the other end is just hooked under the running stitch. And this is done so that there are no protruding suture um, bits that can abrade the cornea. You always have to avoid vertical tension because vertical tension can cause reduction in the vertical height, can cause ectropion. The location of the defect, if you have a midline defect, uh, 
uh, it is quite easy to close the defect primarily. And uh, marginal and juxtra marginal defects are also quite to, uh, good to be closed primarily. If you have a lateral and or a medial defect, then you have to do additional procedures because the lid doesn't really approximate well in uh, those circumstances. Now, the closure, the primary closure of a defect is only possible for about 25 to 30 percent of loss of lid. So you cannot be overzealous and cl close the wound under tension. So anything up to 30 uh, percent of lid loss can be closed primarily by these uh, suture techniques. And it's also important to understand what is the role of the, the canthal ligaments. You know that the medial canthal ligament has two slips uh, and one attaches to the posterior crest, the other to the anterior crest and they encircle the lacrimal sac. The posterior uh, limb is what gives the tension to the lower lip. Likewise, the lateral canthal ligament also has two slips, a superior crust and an inferior crust, and it uh, just inserts into the orbital margin. Now, this is important to know because uh, for two reasons. One, if you want to mobilize the lid to be closed primarily beyond the 20% to get more lid laxity, uh, we have to do a canthotomy and a cantholysis, either an inferior cantholysis or a superior cantholysis, depending upon the, the lid that you want to close primarily. And secondly, when we do advancement flaps, which I will come to later, we have to reconstruct the medial and lateral canthal suspensions again. Otherwise, the lower lid will not have any um, structural integrity or the sling of the lower lid will be lost. So um, defects no larger than 25 to 30 percent of the lid can be closed primarily as I mentioned to you. You make it pentagonal. If additional mobilization is required, then you do a canthotomy. And once you do a canthotomy, you cut the lateral canthal tendon. And once the lateral canthal ligament is cut, then the lower lid uh, moves much more. So you get another five to eight millimeters of mobilization if you cut the um, lateral canthal uh, uh, ligament. Now, uh, canthotomy and cantholysis is something that every ENT surgeon should know. So it's not a difficult procedure to do, and it really helps in mobilizing the lid, the residual lid, to be approximated primarily. Now, in cases where the lid cannot be approximated primarily, uh, we have to consider two options, broadly two options. Uh, one is advancement flaps, and the second is switch flaps. That is how they are broadly classified. And sometimes we have to use a combination of these techniques to reconstruct both the lamella, because some of the flaps only provide tissue for one lamella, and you'll have to consider other options to reconstruct uh, what has not been provided by the flap. So we'll start with this upper eyelid, 25 to 30 percent ca uh, direct closure cantholysis, uh, 50 to 75 percent cantholysis or use of a tensile flap, more than 75 percent uh, cutler beard flap or a modified huge flap. In the lower eyelid, 25 percent is direct closure, 25 to 50 percent is cantholysis or a tensile flap, and more than 50 percent or 70 percent we can use a huge flap. I will describe the flaps in the subsequent slides. Now I'd mentioned to you that if you have a central defect, it's quite okay to um, you know, approximate it primarily or do a canthal release and then approximate it. But in some instances, um, we may not be able to do that. Even with the canthal release, we may not be able to do that. So in order to reconstruct the sling, uh, or in order to reconstruct the lateral canthal suspensory mechanism, we can harvest a periosteal flap that is based on the orbital margin, as you can see in the picture here. <clears throat> this is usually five millimeters wide, and it is dissected over the bone here and reflected 180 degrees, and that is sutured to the tarsal plate. Now, this tendon can act as the posterior lamella, and you can do a simple procedure like a temporal skin flap where you incise the 
canthus and advanced skin and that provides the anterior lamella so for a lateral defect where you need to reconstruct the suspensory mechanism you can raise the periosteum leaving it attached to the orbital margin which is 5 mm wide suture to the remnant tarsus on the lid and then advance the skin flap over it to close the uh, suspensory neo suspensory mechanism now you can use this even for larger defects now what are the options that we have in case you don't want to do um, full thickness skin graft let's say that the posterior lamella is intact or the orbicularis is intact uh, but you're still not keen on doing a full thickness skin graft there are some options that we can use uh, by borrowing skin from the local site one is a freaky flap where you can uh, take a laterally based skin flap from just above the eyebrow uh it is dissected out and just flipped over and the defect is closed and this is closed primarily uh in some cases a vy advancement for small defects can be done and uh, the trippier flap is a bipedical flap that is taken uh, that is skin from the either the upper or the lower lid but tradition is described as a switch from the upper to the lower lid and uh, this is quite okay if you don't want to do a full thickness skin graft but you want to borrow skin from adjacent sites now coming to the advancement flaps so these flaps are what are most uh, commonly used and uh, the uh, one of the earliest described advancement flaps was the cutler beard flap uh, for upper eyelid defects uh, cutler beard was described in 1955 and uh, there is some controversy about the cutler beard flap because some textbooks uh, and some literature will tell you that it is a purely um, you know a flap that does not include the tarsus whereas some papers would say that it is an advancement of the full thickness of the segment of the lower lid uh, but there is some confusion there but uh, the traditional description is that it is just the skin and the minimal subcutaneous tissue without the tarsal plate and to give support we have to use an additional cartilage graft to be placed between the layers of the cutler beard flap so how we raise the cutler beard flap is that uh, we make an incision for 3 to 5 mm below the lid margin on the lower lid uh, then the conjunctiva is also incised now the conjunctiva is dissected up to the fornix and up to the orbital margin the skin is taken under the skin bridge taken to the um, upper eyelid the uh, which is present there and then the um, skin is then closed uh, to the defect and uh, this will result in a closed eye uh, for the patient because you have to wait for this bridge of skin and subcutaneous tissue to draw blood supply from the upper lid and usually it is kept occluded for 6 to 8 weeks and after 6 to 8 weeks we divide the uh, bridge of skin here and then uh, suture the lower lid remnants back to this margin and the upper lid uh, skin margin is kept slightly inverted to prevent the corneal abrasion like i had mentioned the traditional description does not mention it to be a tarso conjunctival flap uh, but um it is quite confusing because uh, some books and some literature does describe it as a through and through incision because it makes sense that uh, the lower lid tarsus is much shorter than the upper lid tarsus so i don't think if you raise a skin flap like this you're going to incorporate any of the tarsus of the lower lid and any compromise of the lower lid tarsus is going to cause um, vertical shortening of the lower lid now uh, this is an example of how the um, the uh, cutler beard is combined with a cartilage graft so you first uh, put the conjunctival flap in place then you put a ear cartilage in place and then you suture the skin to the skin defect now this ear cartilage is between two vascularized pieces of tissue and then after 8 weeks you divide the bridge of skin and then you have the new upper lid and the resutured lower lid so this is probably the traditional uh, cutler beard that was described 
but again there is some controversy with its description this is an example of a cutler beard done for a almost total upper eyelid loss as you can see here the flap that we raise um, does not include too much of the tarsus it's just the skin subcutaneous and some of the orbicularis muscle and then there is suture to the upper uh, uh, lid defect and you wait for six to eight weeks before dividing the bridge of skin and uh, opening the patient's eyes afterwards now the problem with the cutler beard is that you don't reconstruct the lid margin uh, we don't reconstruct the eyelashes you don't reconstruct the um, secretory margin of the lid that is not done so switch flaps were described by mustade in the 1980s and the advantage of a switch flap is that you bring like tissue to replace like tissue and large defects also can be repaired a lid, mar lid margin is obtained now if you look at the blood supply <coughs> of the this is for upper eyelid defects if you look at the blood supply of the lower lid the medial blood supply is from the angular artery and the nasal arteries whereas the lateral blood supply is from the temporal superficial temporal artery and there is an arcade now the um, the flap that is most vascular is a medially based um, lower lid switch flap because the vascular supply is more robust and you have to keep the incision well beyond 5 mm to preserve the arterial arcade of the lower lid and it's just like an abbe flap it is just twisted and sutured to the upper lid but there is shortening of the lower lid because of that and then there are some secondary reconstruction procedures that need to be done uh, the picture on the left is a laterally based flap um, as i mentioned the vascularity of the laterally based flap is not as good as the medially based flap but these flaps are seldom used nowadays uh, with the advent of the or you know the uh, advancement flaps probably are uh, more commonly done than the switch flaps now if you have a defect which is slightly bigger which uh, you cannot close by primary uh, you know primary closure or by cantholysis then tenzel has described the uh, semicircular flap uh, which is which can be used both for upper and lower eyelid so you can reconstruct um, up to 70% defects of the um, upper and lower eyelids now basically if you have a lower lid defect you mark a skin incision which goes in a semicircular fashion and the width of this is about 2 to 3 cm and it is just below the eyebrow you do have to release the uh, canthal ligament and you have to undermine the skin uh, which is an it's a myocutaneous undermining so you have to undermine the orbicularis muscle also and once this is undermined the lid is then um, approximated to the cut end on the other side when you do this you have to remember to resuspend the lateral canthus by taking a stitch through the periosteum and the problem with the tenzel flap is that you're only reconstructing the anterior lamella you're not reconstructing the posterior lamella so if you want to reconstruct the posterior lamella you can use a periosteal strip as i showed you earlier or you can take a tarso conjunctival flap from the upper lid and turn it around into the lower lid and reconstruct the posterior lamella you have to be very careful of resuspending the resuspending the lateral canthal uh, support otherwise the lower lid will not have any uh, will lose its uh, sling mechanism if you have an upper lid defect that you have to close the uh, semicircle is in the opposite direction but the principle is the same you have to uh, undermine the skin deep to the orbicularis you cut the lateral canthal crust you mobilize the skin and the tarsal plate and then you suture it to the remnant upper eyelid and reconstruct the posterior lamella with a tarso conjunctival flap from the lower lid so this has to be done otherwise the patient might have problems with corneal aberration so there's some uh, facts about the tensile flap that you must remember up to 70% of defects you know the defect uh, length can be closed with the tensile flap 
but the important thing is some remnant tarsal should remain on either side of the defect that is very important if you want to try and do a tensile flap and uh, there is no eye closure so if you look at the hughes flap or the cutler beard the patient has to be will have his eyes closed for six so if he has poor vision in the opposite eye it will be a problem for him to manage his day to day activities so it is uh, in a way good for people who have poor vision in the opposite eye because it eliminates the need for closure of the eye now just like how the cutler beard is a good flap for large defects of the upper eyelid that is more than 70% the hughes flap is a good uh, flap for reconstructing defects of the lower eyelid so when there is 50 or 70% of the defect of the lower eyelid through and through defect uh, we can use a hughes flap uh, it was described way back in um, 1937 and uh, the this flap is pr primarily described for reconstructing the posterior lamella you must remember in the cutler beard you are reconstructing the anterior lamella the classical cutler beard you are reconstructing the, an the anterior lamella whereas the uh, the you do reconstruct the conjunctiva as well but you don't reconstruct the tarsus but here this flap is purely for the posterior lamella so what you do in a in a huge flap is uh, you make an incision uh, in the upper lid and uh, this incision is deepened to the tarsus and on the other side of the tarsus you will see the orbicularis muscle the dissection is done um, all the way to the orbital Uh, ridge uh, where you will see the uh, levators of the upper eyelid that they have to be preserved then you take this tarso conjunctival tissue which you have raised from the upper lid and then you suture it uh, you flip it 180 degrees and you suture it to the tarsus of the lower lid the remnant tarsus of the lower lid and then the uh, orbicularis muscle can be skin grafted <coughs> now this follows the same principle as that of the cutler beard where you have to wait for 6 to 8 weeks before you can divide this bridge of skin and once the bridge of skin is divided you have to sharp uh, transect sharply the the upper lid here and then you always keep the conjunctiva about 1 to 2 mm longer to avoid entropion and using a huge flap you can reconstruct uh, very large defects of the lower eyelid the only problem is that uh, this is primarily a posterior lamella reconstruction and you will have to skin graft the outside of the orbicularis muscle now another flap which is not being used that commonly is mustardi so if you have defects more than 75% of the lower lid you can use a cheek rotation flap otherwise the mustardi is flap in the mustard eye flap you have to extend the defect you'll have to cut more uh, you know inverted cone of tissue from the um, lid margins and then you um, raise a skin flap which goes along the cheek and then curves inferiorly preauricularly now this is undermined till about 1 cm to where the defect is and then this is then slid over and sutured to the um the remnant lid margin medially some sort of posterior lamellar reconstruction has to be done again and uh, it's only an anterior lamellar reconstruction that you're doing the posterior lamellar reconstruction is when nasal septal cartilage or heart palate mucosa there are several technical aspects to be considered and uh, this is the same technical aspects that you will consider when you're planning a mustard eye flap for a cheek defect but it's seldom used today because of the other techniques that are more commonly employed this is an example of a mustard eye flap so if you have a lateral lid defect uh, which is not much uh, then you can use uh, the mustard eyes if it's a central defect or a medial defect then you are better off using uh, some other flap to reconstruct the anterior and posterior lamella now another peculiar problem is the medial canthal defects so for medial canthal defects um, we can borrow tissue from the glabellar region 
or we can borrow tissue from the forehead. Now, the glabular uh, um, tissue is quite okay because you can just mark the flap and then the flap has a transposition movement uh, like a Limburg flap and then it sits quite well in the medial canthal defects and the flaps can be longer extended into a forehead flap if part of the medial lid also has to be excised. Now the medial lid area has got several components especially the lacrimal apparatus, the pump and things like that, uh, the sac. So you have to have uh, a plan in mind how you're going to keep it canalized and you have to uh, address that issue as well. But here, always try to preserve the posterior attachment of the uh, medial canthal uh, tendon to the posterior crust because that is what gives structural support to the lower eyelid. If you don't have that, then you have to take sutures through the periosteum or do transnasal wiring, whichever is uh, more comfortable. Otherwise, the patient, patient will have telecanthus. So tissue from the glabella or you know, extended forehead flaps are quite okay for medial canthal defects to um, reconstruct uh, you know, uh, the medial canthus and the adjoining lower lid. This is another example of a small uh, flap that is raised from the medial part of the root of the nose. And uh, you know, these local flaps are better because uh, the donor site also is closed primarily and there is no um, tension on the wound edges. So coming back to the original uh, slide that I had shown you, upper lid 25 to 30 percent is direct closure or cantholysis, 50 to 75 percent is cantholysis or a tensile flap, more than 75 percent is a cutler beard flap. The lower eyelid, 25% is direct closure, 25 to 50% is cantholysis tensile flap, and more than 50% is a Hughes flap. So I've tried to keep this presentation simple because the only flaps that you need to really master <coughs> are the tensile flap, the Hughes, and the Cutler beard. So the defect size dictates the choice of flap that is used. The options are between advancement flaps and lid switches. Advancements are more commonly used now than lid switch flaps. You have to aim to maintain the vertical height of the lids to avoid complications. Recreate the medial and lateral canthal suspensions of the lower eyelid. And another important thing that you should always remember is when you're reconstructing the tarsus, uh, you have to suture the remnant levi uh, levators of the upper lid namely the levator palpebrae and the Muller's muscle to the neotorsus. Otherwise, the patient will have torsus uh, of the eye, especially if his Bell's phenomenon is uh, inadequate. So you have to re-suture the cut end of the remnant levators to the neotorsus to prevent torsus. So that is the end of the uh, first presentation on lid reconstruction. Yeah. So the uh, second uh, relatively uncommon reconstruction that we practice is lip reconstruction. Now, uh, lip reconstruction for many reasons is uh, quite challenging because the lip is a far more complex uh, structure than it appears. Uh, the lip is not only part of the aesthetics of the face, but it's also functionally important because it is uh, part of the oral sphincteric mechanism. There are several ways to reconstruct the lip. Uh, you either borrow tissue from the lip itself or you borrow tissue from the adjacent sites. And the location and the size of the lip defect dictates what flap we use. So the um, things that we have to consider in this presentation are the relevant anatomy of the lip, the aims of lip reconstruction, how do we classify lip defects, what are the reconstructive options for lip defects, how do we do commissure reconstruction, total reconstruction of the lip, and what are the problems and outcomes of lip reconstruction? So before we begin, we need to have a sound knowledge of the lip anatomy and its function. And we also have to uh, remember about or uh, keep in mind the remarkable distensibility of lip tissue, meaning that uh, we can quite easily get away by distending the residual lip or using borrowing lip from the uh, 
opposite side uh, to fill in the defects. We also have to understand how small the oral sphincter can get, but still be functional. We have to understand what are the local and regional tissue transfers that can be done for lip reconstruction. And always have plan B for lip reconstruction because uh, these tumors tend to recur and you must be um, familiar with free flap transfer techniques, uh, which are also useful for massive defects of the lip. So if you look at the lip, the lip has several distinct landmarks. You have the, in the upper lip, you have the filtral columns, the filtral groove. You have the white roll, which is most distinct in the central area. You have the cupid's bow and you have the tubercle. And the lower lip is usually uh, generally featureless. And uh, it's got a very wide vermilion, which is widest in the central lip. Now, regarding distensibility, in the lower lip, up to 40% of the lower lip defects can be closed primarily. And up to 25% of upper lip defects can be closed primarily. Some books and uh, literature tends to argue to the fact that it's only 25% for both lips, but the lower lip is slightly more amenable for primary closure compared to the upper lip. Now, the, uh, the lip is not a simple structure because it's not the orbicularis aurus alone that is a part of the lip. Several other uh, muscles of facial expression also attach to the lip. And one of the most important aspects that we should remember is when we do lip reconstruction, we must not disturb the modiolus, uh, which acts as a central point trying to anchor all the muscles of facial uh, expression. So whatever lip reconstruction you attempt, try not to disturb the modiolus if possible. Now that uh, the lip in cross section is a trilaminar structure. So you have the mucosal surface on the inside. You have the labial artery after that. Then you have the orbicularis uh, muscle. Then you have the skin uh, with its subcutaneous tissue. Now you must always remember the position of the uh, labial artery because this is what will help you uh, when you're planning for your lip switches or lip advancements. It's on the inner aspect of the lip or the mucosal aspect and not on the outer aspect. Uh, so when you're planning for incisions for lip reconstruction, remember the aesthetic lines of the face, remember the distensibility of the lip. The upper lip has two aesthetic subunits, whereas the lower lip has only one aesthetic subunit. And remember not to cross the aesthetic lines when you plan your incisions. So how do you optimize results in lip reconstruction? So the, there are some key factors that you must consider and remember when you're planning lip reconstruction. One is respect the aesthetic lines on and around the lips when you're planning the incision. Mark the white roll because proper alignment of the white roll is most important for lip, uh, lip reconstruction or when you're primarily suturing the lip. Depending upon the laxity, uh, the lip can be closed primarily or tissue can be borrowed. When you're doing a, a lip switch procedure, always try to occlude the pedicle to ensure vascularity. I will show, show you pictures about that. When there is not enough tissue from the same or adjacent lip, the next best choice to recruit tissue is from the cheek. Don't divide muscles attached to the modulus. And if you're doing a radial forearm flap, perform an Allen's test before harvesting the flap. So, in a nutshell, if you look at lower lip defects, because they are the most common defects that we encounter, if you have less than one third defects, you can do primary closure uh, either as a wedge, as a W plasty, or a bilateral advancement flaps. If it's one third to two third, if the defects are medial defects, use carapandic, a bay, or a staircase flap. If the defects are lateral, then you have to consider one important factor. Will your flap cause microstoma or not? Because if you have lost a lot of lip tissue and if you attempt a flap which causes microstoma, you defeat the purpose of reconstructing the lip. So if the microstoma is unlikely, meaning you have uh, enough tissue that will cause a wide oral uh, uh, you know, opening, mouth opening, then you can consider the Eslander carapandic or a staircase flap. 
if you have lost a lot of tissue and microstoma is possible if you try to do flap reconstruction, then you should consider a Gillies flap or a nasolabial flap. When you see massive defects that is more than two thirds of the lip, then you have to uh, recruit tissue from the cheek that is called the Webster Bernard flap. And when there is no local tissue available and you wish to reconstruct the lower lip sling, then you have to look for distant flaps for reconstruction. So it is very simple, less than a third, the third to two third, again, medial and lateral, and more than two third, whether you have local tissue available or not. Now you have to be able to calculate the lip stock. See, the total lip length is about 15 to 16 centimeters at rest. The upper lip is larger than the lower lip by one centimeter. If the oral sphincter is considered to be circle, to be a circle, simple geometry dictates that its diameter is equal to its circumference divided by pi, which is just over five centimeters. But the oral sphincter is not, um, the oral sphincter is actually oval. And uh, the calculated distance is more or less taken as a normal oral opening. So it means that the intercommissural distance should be about five to six centimeters for you to say that the patient has got a normal oral um, uh, intercommissural distance or a normal you know, space between the two commissures. So what happens if you need to maintain three centimeters of mouth opening, that three centimeters basically is what will allow a spoon, a width of a tablespoon to enter the mouth. So anything less than an intercommissural uh, distance of three centimeters will functionally, uh, you know, uh, debilitate the patient. So you have to have a minimum of three centimeters mouth opening because then uh, you can use a spoon to eat. So if you lose uh, six centimeters of both the upper and lower lips, then a three centimeter tissue will be only available if you don't import any other tissue. So if you lose six centimeter or more of lip tissue combined upper and lower lip tissue, it's always good to import tissue to maintain the intercommissural distance. And um, if you want to maintain a three centimeter opening, you need to have about nine centimeter of lip stock. So let's look at partial thickness defects first. The table that I showed you earlier this is for lower lips, which are through and through defects. So this is just to get the ball rolling on the flaps that we do. But those are for through and through defects. But to begin with, let's look at partial thickness. So partial thickness defects mean that the underlying muscle or the underlying lip structure is intact. So you can just uh, have defects which need lip resurfacing, that is vermilion defects. Or you can have uh, defects of the skin. Uh, which are cutaneous defects. So if you have a vermilion defect, you can do an advancement or myomucosal switch flaps or fam flaps. If you have cutaneous lip defects, then we can do advancements and transpositions. And sometimes if you have a very small partial thickness defect, it may be okay to convert it to a full thickness defect in men because the hair and the beard can camouflage the scar of the full thickness defect. So these are some of the uh, examples of partial thickness where the vermilion and the mucosa is lost. So you can use do a vermilion switch. You can do a bipedical vermilion transfer, or you can do a vermilion advancement here. So the problem here is if you use a vermilion advancement, the lip tends to be more rounded, more red, and more recessed. But it's always better to reconstruct the mucosal defects by either advancements or a vermilion switch or a bipedicle uh, vermilion transfer or vestibular mucosa transfer because they are replacing like with like that is secretory mucosa. If you have cutaneous defects, you can try doing advancement flaps. So or VY advancements as you can see here, or if it's in the, um, uh, the, the, the area below the lip, you can do a nasolabial flap in certain instances to close cutaneous defects. But this fo follows the principle of any cutaneous defect reconstruction. And these are also quite rare uh, considering the fact uh, that 
you know, there are lip tumors which extend to the skin and they have to be treated as one uh, unit. So isolated cutaneous defects may be rare in uh, lip uh, tumors. Now, what are the types of excisions that facilitate closure? It's not uh, just a straight uh, wound margins which will you know, allow you to close it uh, primarily without tension and with proper esthesis. Uh, you can do a wide variety of extensions to your incision. You can use a flared W, you can do a single barrel, you can do a double barrel, or you can just do a wedge-shaped excision. And if you do these excisions, the resultant scar will be much finer and much more aesthetically pleasing. So you have to do pre-operative planning when you're trying to excise these tumors uh, through and through. Now, if you have a defect that you wish to close primarily, and the defect isn't approximating in the midline, then you have to give releasing incisions and remove intervening skin bridges. So these are some things called perialar crescents, where you remove the skin and subcutaneous tissue, and you have labiomental excesses in the chin area where the labiomental crease exists. So if you remove the perialar crescent, this will become a flap here. And this perialar crescent will allow this to become a flap and facilitate uh, approximation. And for the lower lip, uh, you can use the labiomental excess. So if you need to release tissue to make it advance, use a perialar crescent for the upper lip and use the labiomental excess in the lower lip by removing that piece of skin and subcutaneous tissue and the lips can be approximated. This is a flap that I use uh, uh, if I have a midline lower lip defect. This is called a stepladder flap, which is exactly what the word indicates. You make an incision in a stepladder fashion and remove the rectangular piece of skin and subcutaneous tissue uh, in the areas of the steps. And once this is moved, these steps override each other and the lip will also meet in the midline. And this scar is hidden by the labiomental crease. So this is quite good for midline lower lip defects. I mean, you can always use the labiomental excess and incise and then advance it. But uh, this allows for slightly more movement of the residual lower lip. And then the residual scar is also aesthetically uh, hidden along the labiomental crease. So you, we had seen partial thickness defects where we used vermilion uh, mucosa, vestibular mucosa. We looked at uh, how to plan small defects, uh, small excisions such as a W or a single barrel or a flange. Also, we looked at how to excised perialar uh, tissue or labiomental tissue to make advancement flaps. But what if the lip defect is not amenable to primary closure? So large lower lip defects, we either borrow from the uh, lip or we recruit from the cheek. So borrowing from the lip, again, depends upon the location of the defect. Uh, if you have uh, a medial or a lateral defect, uh, probably lateral defect is uh, probably more uh, in tune. You can use an abe flap, but if there's a lateral defect, which a slander flap is used. If you don't have tissue to borrow from the upper lip, then you recruit from the cheek. If it's a central defect, uh, you can use a carapandic, a Bernard, or a Gillies flap. So uh, you have to decide up front if you're going to borrow from the lip or you're going to recruit from the cheek. The Abbey flap is the most commonly described flap for lip to lip reconstruction. Now, the Abbey flap is based on the uh, labial artery. What we basically do is take a triangular piece of tissue, which is the uh, part of the upper lip, and this is turned and sutured to the lower lip defect, and the upper lip defect uh, is closed uh, primarily. Now, for a period of six to eight weeks, there is the intact pedicle that is present here. And this pedicle is what perfuses the flap for the initial few weeks until the flap draws its vascularity from the surrounding tissue. Uh, it is good because there's the mac this flap offers maximum probability of return of sensory function. Uh, 
and an abase flap can be either a medially based abase flap or a laterally based meaning either you have the blood flow coming from the medial aspect or you can have the blood flow coming from the lateral aspect and there is a difference between the two when it comes to the interim functional outcome so if you have an ipsilaterally based pedicle it creates a very small stoma on the index side and a reasonably large stoma on the opposite side if you use uh, and it's slightly harder to rotate so if you have an ipsilaterally based pedicle it's easier to eat with when a patient does not have to struggle with eating until the pedicle is divided if you have a contralaterally based flap it's easier to rotate but it creates two small sized openings and it makes it difficult for the patient to eat before the pedicle is divided so an ipsilaterally based um abay flap is a good option for defects which are 1/3 to 2/3 of the lower lip and uh, the ipsilaterally based flap also allows for uh, acceptable eating during the period that the pedicle is not divided now prior to the div division of the pedicle you can always occlude the pedicle with a, a rubber tourniquet or a piece of gauze to see for vascularity of the flap by pricking it only if the vascularity is confirmed should the pedicle be divided if the pedicle was if the vascularity of the flap is not sufficient then we have to wait for a few more weeks till it gets reliably perfused from the surrounding tissue and the pedicle then is divided the eslender flap is the same principle as the abay flap uh, it is you base it on the labial artery but it's for uh, resections which involve the commissure uh, the problem with the abay flap is that it creates a rounded commissure and uh, as with the abay there is no addition of lip stock so you have to remember that you're not uh, uh, providing the lip with more tissue and we should not get below the minimum 9 cm total lip stock uh, that will make the patient functionally uh, crippled so uh, these uh, lip switches do not offer any additional lip stock uh, for reconstruction the gillies flap is another flap that can be used if the defect is in the midline uh, it's a full thickness incision and it pivots around the commissure and it can be done for both the upper and for the lower lips it also results in a more rounded commissure but the problem with the gillies flap is because it's a through and through incision it is a de innervated flap there is no sensation on the lip or the commissure and it's largely been replaced by the carapandic flap now the carapandic flap is uh, you know an advancement flap uh, where we don't add anything much to the lip stock again but we have to use incisions on the cheek which are not through and through thereby preserving the neurovascular uh, integrity uh, the incision is through and through here at the lip level but uh, as you go further you have to make sure you preserve the uh, neurovascular mantle before giving the complete incision and the uh, the two flaps are advanced and they suture in the midline now this is a problem with the carapandic the carapandic uh, flap creates a microstoma because you don't add any lip stock uh, to these patients so because of this uh, the patient becomes functionally a cripple and uh they cannot eat uh without the help of a spoon but the advantage of a carapandic is that it is a innervated flap and hence the lip is a sensate lip so this is a large lip excision where the uh, skin of the mentum also is excised this is a carapandic flap which is raised on both sides brought to the midline and then the skin was undermined and closed so very large defects of the lip can be closed but uh, in most cases it will end up with a microstoma for the patients and remember at the commissure level do not damage the neurovascular bundle to preserve the uh, the sensory supply to the residual lip now for even larger defects if it's more than 2/3 of the lip then uh, we have to recruit tissue from the cheek and webster bernard is one of the flaps that has been described now as i mentioned earlier where you in, you know incise and take out a piece of periaeolar crescent uh, 
you have to take out triangular pieces of tissue to facilitate movements and advancements of these flaps. So there are many versions and updates of the Webster Bernard. What we do is for the lips to move and meet in the midline, we give releasing incisions on the cheek, take it up to the nasolabial area and remove a piece of uh, skin here to facilitate the advancement. And we also take the incision down to the um, mental crease on both sides. And this is undermined to full thickness. And then the lip is brought into approximation. There is some augmentation of the lip tissue because we are borrowing a tissue from the cheek, but it's largely static tissue because it does not contain the orbicularis uh, muscle and hence it's only a static reconstruction and not a dynamic reconstruction. So this is another example where uh, you have taken away triangular uh, pieces of tissue, triangles of uh, tissue and subcutaneous tissue, skin and subcutaneous tissue. You have made releasing incisions along the uh, mental crease and the mental protuberance. And then you have raised this as a flap, raised uh, the other side as a flap as well. This is a raised flap that you can see and then the flap approximated in the midline. So this is a typical way the, the Webster Bernard is done. Unfortunately, there is not too much augmentation of the lip stop, but it's certainly better than what we would do with a carapandic flap. Uh, this is a picture that I'd shown you earlier. The nasolabial flap can also be used either for uh, one-sided uh, uh, defects or for total lip defects. But again, these tend to sag with time and the vertical height of the lower lip uh, tends to decrease with time. It's also a static reconstruction. There is no sling and the oral commission may not be uh, as good as compared to a radial forearm with a palmaris sling. Now, if you want to do a total lip, uh, lower lip reconstruction and you want to make it dynamic, uh, there are several factors of the defect that we have to consider. We have loss of volume and shape. We have loss of the lip height. There is no vestibule. There is no sphinx, uh, sphincter. Uh, the flap, uh, whatever flap that we put in, is going to be insensate and it's very difficult to predict the long-term result. So this is a patient who had a total lower lip uh, resection and uh, marginal mandibulectomy also. And uh, all these factors are important to consider when you're planning for total lip reconstruction, especially with a free flap. So the ideal flap to use in these circumstances is a radial forearm flap. So part of the flap uh, covers the skin and the other part of the flap covers the mucosa lining on the inside. The first picture shows you a free palmaris uh, tendon as a, as a sling. Now this tendon is taken around the commissure and if possible sutured to the upper lip near the midline and a subcuticular tunnel is made on the flap and the flap is uh, and the palmaris is suspended under the subcuticular uh, tunnel because if you suspend it under the pedicle the flap will necrose so you've got to create a subcuticular tunnel tunnel the palmaris tendon take the palmaris tendon to the upper lip so that it forms a circumoral sphincter and suture it to the muscle muscles of the upper lip and then the pedicle is taken to the neck and vascular anastomosis is performed now this doesn't look aesthetically pleasing because you have not reconstructed the mucosa over time, this lower lid tends to sag down even if you have uh, reconstructed the sling mechanism. There is no real optimal way to adjust the height of the lower lid, a lower lip. Uh, but it's always better to overcorrect, uh, taking into account the um, decrease in the vertical height of the lid with time. And uh, this is probably the, the best way to reconstruct a total lip, lip through and through defect where you want to reconstruct the sling as well. Now, the, the last part is the commissure reconstruction, which is very complex. And it is uh, the most important aspect of lip reconstruction. Uh, most scars can be hidden of the commissure, but you cannot hide the ruling of, the, uh, of saliva at the commissural area. So you've got to remember that. And uh, there are some flaps which will automatically correct the commissure like the slander. But uh, there are some other flaps which have been described for a long time that is a Zissa and the Brusatis flap, uh, which are used for commissure reconstruction. And as I'd shown you in the pictures earlier, if you have a contiguous defect, a radial forearm flap with the sling is ideal 
uh, in these circumstances. The important thing to remember is the commissioner uh, position and uh, they are based on the rights facial landmarks. Usually the commissioner is at the mid pupillary line. So when you plan to reconstruct the commissioner, always keep it in line with the pupil of the patient. So if you have resection of a tumor at the commissure area alone, we can use an advancement of the cheek skin and you can also use the mucosal flap from the buccal mucosa. This is called the scissors flap. And in the scissors flap, you also de-epithelize part of the skin that you're advancing to give bulk to the commissure and then you advance the mucosa to suture the skin and the mucosa together. And uh, this is probably good for isolated defects of the commissure, which is not involved in the lip. If it involves the lip, then you go ahead and do an slander flap for the patient. The Brusati's flap is better for uh, defects which are horizontal compared to the Zisser's flap. So here also you can see that the triangles of skin have been removed. A flap has been elevated here. This is where the defect is going to be. The flap is then uh, advanced into the commissural defect. The skin here is incised and turned over and a new commissure is, is uh, reconstructed. So the scissor and brissati are the two flaps that we use for isolated commissure reconstructions. But uh, it's very rare to find tumors which only have isolated uh, commissure involvement. But even if, if you do, then these two flaps are probably good options for uh, commissure reconstruction. Uh, there is another flap called the orbicularis oris flap. So if you have to reconstruct the commissure, and this is a patient who's had a large ALT flap which was sutured to the commissure, in case you want to reconstruct the commissure, the lip can be incised at the level deep to the orbicularis muscle. And because the muscle can be distended and pulled, uh, it is a sort of advancement of the muscle into the defect. So an orbicularis oris advancement flap, this has been described a long time ago, but it's uh, uh, useful if you're doing secondary procedures where you can uh, advance the orbicularis muscle along with the overlying mucosa and inserting it into the uh, neocommissure. Now, because it has muscle, uh, the muscle will unite with the muscle of the opposite side and will form a sphincter in due course. But for large lip and commissure defects, there is no other option but to use uh, a free flap. Uh, so the same principle applies. You can take a radial forearm flap or an ALT flap, use a facial sling, a subcuticular tunnel is made. Uh, you can use the palmaris longus tendon. If it's not long enough, you can harvest strips of facial lata. Uh, you have to take the sling to the midpoints of the upper and lower lip, and you have to tighten it considerably. It's better to be a bit tight and uh, suture to the midpoints of the upper and the lower lip. Uh, lip. And this gives a complete and commissure, and uh, this allows for patient to be able to eat without much drooling. This is another example, and this is the, what I meant by the subcuticular tunnel, where, or the subcutaneous tunnel, where the tunnel is made between the uh, vascular pedicle and the skin and subcutaneous tissue. Because if it goes deep to this, you're going to uh, compress the vascular pedicle and the distal part of the flap will necrose. Now there are several problems to having a cheek commissure and lip reconstruction. It's very difficult to get the final position in the right place. It's very difficult to uh, get the height in the right uh, position because the patients will have radiation and scar and contraction and fibrosis. It's difficult to uh, decide on the tension of the sling and the commissure area will always have a skin line portion because that is the intervening part between the extra mucosal and the mucosal paddles of the radial forearm. So the approximation here at the commissure also is an area that you have to be careful. So it's not a very perfect uh, reconstruction, but patients more or less are functionally okay using a radial forearm with a palm arms. It's not uncommon to see patients who have large cheek tumors where large parts of skin have to be involved, uh, have to be excised. We have to be clear about the goals of reconstruction and have reasonable expectations. And we always have to be prepared for doing a secondary reconstruction for these patients. So here, uh, just using a, an ALT flap and planning for a secondary commissure 
correction is quite okay because you have to take into account the uh, healing for the patient, the longevity of the patient, the disease-free internal of the patient, and then uh, you can always deaptalize this portion of the skin, uh, use a sling, and reconstruct the commissure for these patients. Sometimes a combination of flaps have to be used. So this patient has a lip defect, a lip tumor which is extending to the cheek. So you can use a combination of a submental flap for the cheek and the nasolabial flap for lining the inner aspect of the lip or an abbey flap for the lip reconstruction. So a combination of local flaps also can be done. You don't have to do double free flaps to reconstruct composite uh, defects of the cheek and lip. Even local flaps can be done as is shown here to get a reasonable outcome. But again, the commissure is an area of problem and you have to be prepared to do secondary commissure pr procedures in the future to get commissure competence. So microstoma or macrostoma, the question is always a big problem to answer. Macrostoma is functionally more debilitating because of oral leak. Uh, there are several techniques to correct them. Uh, microstoma can be corrected by the release and advancement of uh, cheek skin and buccal mucosa. And uh, macrostoma can be corrected by deaptalizing the skin or whatever flap that we have used and then using a palmaris tendon. And it is very difficult to achieve primary competency, uh, competency in the primary setting unless we opt in for a more tight commissure and for microstoma. So there are several bad cases, you know, patients who've had both radial forearms taken with still lip defects that are bad, but we can always make use of the local tissues that are available, follow principles of uh, skin reconstruction and local flap advancements. And uh, you can always uh, find a way to reconstruct even grossly debilitating defects such as these. So in the end, uh, always try to replace like with like. Uh, if you have enough tissue to recruit from the adjacent lip, please do that because that is the most likely way of getting a sensate lip back to the patient. Always remember never to compromise on lip stock. Have adequate lip stock to ensure an intercommissural opening of at least three centimeters. If you have microstoma or macrostoma, or if the patient has commission and competence, be prepared for secondary procedures. Local flaps are the mainstay for most of isolated lip reconstruction. And if you have large defects, a combination of flaps can be done uh, to close uh, the different subunits of the defect. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the Lucius presentation, sir. So shall we take the question, sir? Yeah, that's fine. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the question by Dr. Suma Thapa is, what is modulus? <laughs> what is mod modulus is the part of the cheek where the muscles of facial expression are all attached to. Uh, it is lateral to the commission. So you don't have to, you shouldn't disturb that area when you uh, are planning for lip reconstructions. So try to preserve the integrity of the modulus. Okay. The next question is by Dr. Vinayak. Is six centimeter diameter the cutoff for any decent flap in the lower lip reconstruction? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Is six centimeter diameter of the defect is the cutoff for the distant flap reconstruction? There is no such thing as for distant flap reconstruction. The uh, two main indications are uh, total lower lip reconstruction, or if you have total lower lip reconstruction with adjacent skin loss. So you have to have at least nine centimeters of lip stock intact if you want to borrow from the lip or from the cheek. So there is no size cutoff that is measured like that. It's only the total lip loss or total lip loss with chin skin loss. And you should have at least nine <coughs> centimeters and more of uh, remaining lip to be able to borrow and have a intact intercommissural area of three centimeters. So the next question is, does doctor help in any way regarding blood supply of flap before division of the base flap? And if you Doppler it, you'll be able to Doppler the pedicle where it's running. But then you, you have to know a way of having, uh, being sure that the flap is derived blood supply from the surrounding tissue. That can be only done by manually compressing the pedicle. Only if you manually compress the pedicle and you know uh, uh, impede the blood flow through the labial artery, will you be able to see if there is any collaterals that have developed from the surrounding skin. So you'll have to manually occlude the artery. 
<laughs> so the next question is by Dr. Sridhar. Is there any cutoff measurement to select which specific flap to reconstruct in a lower lip defect? Uh, which cutoff? Any specific measurement uh, Again, to give a cutoff that this specific half flap has to be. It's only one third, two third, and more than okay. two thirds. It's only okay. the same thing. One third, two thirds, and more than two thirds. Okay, sir. And uh, the two questions from Dr. Vinayak is that uh, can we use proline for the facial injuries in case of a facial injuries? What's your opinion on using proline for the skin? Yes, sir. That is fine. That is that is so much. That's quite good. I mean, because uh, proline or ethylone both are fine. You just have to use fine proline or fine ethylone and remove the sutures on the fifth day itself. The edges uh, should be clean cuts. There should be no ragged edges. And uh, you have to have good approximation of the subcutaneous tissue, either with PDS or vicryl, undyed vicryl. Because the final scar on the outside doesn't depend upon the skin closure alone. It's the how good the subcutaneous tissue is uh, closed. Because the subcutaneous in the cuticular tissue is what provides structural uh, strength to the scar, final scar. So it doesn't matter if you use uh, nylon or ethylon. Ethylon is probably easier to see and remove, especially in places where there is hair. But you should have fine cut edges. Um, you should have good subcuticular approximation or subcutaneous approximation and fine sutures for the skin. Uh, avoid picking up the skin with forceps. Just use your thumb to gently evert the lid margin and remove the sutures on the fifth day. Uh, avoid tightening the suture too much, otherwise there'll be railroading of the skin. You can see the railroading pattern on the skin if the suture is too tight. So try to uh, avoid all that. Okay. So the next question is, uh, what is your opinion on nasolabial flap in using for the commissural defects? So, you can use the nasal label flap, but the problem with the nasal label flap is that that part of the commissure, you lose commissure competence there. So you have to be prepared for that. You can use a nasal label flap, you can turn it over and see a superiorly based nasal label flap. The question is by Dr. Vinay. Uh, the, he was, his question was, all the orbital flaps which you have mentioned are only for the malignancy or can it be used for trauma cases too? The, so it's the same principle. Usually for trauma and laceration, most of them will be, you can use them, uh, you can close them primarily or by cantholysis. But I don't see a reason why you can't use them for loss of uh, eyelid following trauma. In fact, it's easier to place composite grafts or uh, tarsal support because the patient won't be receiving any radiation. So uh, I, I don't see any reason why it cannot be done for trauma cases. Okay, sir. So the second question is again by Dr. Vinayak itself. Uh, could the ectropion be caused by the stretch flap? The, could the what, sorry? Ectropion. Ectropion. Ectropion yeah, be caused by switch flap. No, the switch flap will narrow the, the because you're borrowing from the lower lid to the upper lid. The amount of lower lid is reduced and the width of the palpable fissure, that is the transverse segment of the palpable fissure is smaller. I don't see a reason for the, for it to cause ectropion, but it will cause some disturbance in the palpebral fissure. So the eye, you know, the opening of the eye will tend to be smaller compared to advancement flaps. Okay, ectropion sir. is only caused when there is excessive lid laxity and there is no tarsal reconstruction. Okay, sir. Uh, the, so the third question is by Dr. Nikita. Uh, in the mustard flap, what is the lymphatic drainage of the flap? It's only dermal lymphatics. Uh, the important thing, I just saw a question. The important thing about the mustardase flap is because by gravity, it tends to uh, gravitate inferiorly. It tends to pull the suture line and gravitate inferiorly and cause um, ectropion. That is why the flap has to be hitched to the um, orbital wall. So you have to take periosteal stitches to the subcutaneous tissue of the mustardase flap and then suture it to the orbital, you know, the orbital walls, lateral orbital wall. So uh, that will prevent that. And lymphatics is just dermal lymphatics. I don't think there's any specific lymphatics for the mustardase flap. Okay, sir. The, so the next question is by Dr. Ira Nina. How do you reconstruct the nasolapial duct 
if we need to access the medial canthus i mean you get the um, help of uh, your ophthalmology colleagues see if they can cannulate the duct but in cases where uh, the floor of the medial orbital wall is removed then you if you're doing a maxillectomy or a procedure like that you you create a dacrocystostomy anyway otherwise you get uh, help from your ophthalmology colleagues to cannulate the uh, nasolacrimal duct and keep it patent usually ah. when you do lid excisions you don't take out the nasolacrimal duct as such it's only the skin and the tarsal plate and the medial end of the eyelid it's only if it's uh, along with medial wall of the maxilla or medial wall of the or lateral wall of the nose there you're obviously creating a huge dacrocystostomy so um i don't think there is much to worry in those cases otherwise you get the help of your ophthalmology colleagues and cannulate the the um nasolacrimal duct okay <laughs> so uh, the next question is from dr abhimanyu he is asking your experience on posterior lamellar reconstruction which is better as a periosteum or buccal mucosa or heart palate so for lower lid you can use a periosteum because that will also give you some suspensory support because it's attached to the orbital rim uh, but if it's not uh, the lower lid if it's in the midline if the tarsus is intact i mean if the canthal ligaments are intact laterally then uh, you can just use heart palate mucosa uh, or buccal mucosa it doesn't really matter the heart palate is little more firm so you'll get some structure, structural support also otherwise buccal mucosa is fine you can use buccal mucosa also there's no real specific preference okay sir so uh, the other question is from dr nahim uh, sir which tissue is best for tarsal plate reconstruction uh, so the best tissue for tarsal plate reconstruction is the tarsal plate itself so if you're doing a huge flap you will do it so if you do any tarso conjunctival flap like the huge flap replacing like with like that will be the best form of reconstruction but if you're doing it uh, uh, as a static graft you can use uh, nasal septal cartilage or conchal cartilage uh, both work fine they just have to be trimmed to size for the defect and suture to the remnant tarsal plate uh, in the defect otherwise it will tend to deform and always remember you should have a vascular surface surrounding the uh, cartilage grafts otherwise the cartilage grafts can be can undergo necrosis okay sir i think we'll take the last question for this uh, uh, orbital reconstruction sir so yeah. what is the time for uh, nasolacrimal duct decannulation and how long do you uh, keep it uh, in the probe inside uh, i really don't know the answer because i usually send the patients to the ophthalmologist after that Uh, okay. but usually the cases that i have done there's a defect in the floor of the orbit so i have never had to recannulate it per se okay. but uh, probably i don't know the the ophthalmologists are probably the better people who answer that question okay sir so the nasally will flap all the way down so you st- the flap starts here and you go all the way down you can turn the nasally will flap and reconstruct the commissure and the buccal mucosa defects but uh, it still doesn't have any sphincteric action that's the problem so it can be done but you're going to have a, a incomplete sphincter there ah uh, okay sir so the next question is by dr the sphincteric competence is by using a tendon or a, uh, you know using a sling tissue which goes from the upper lip to the lower lip otherwise you're going to have a, a incomplete and commissure on that side okay sir. So the next question is from Dr. Rahul. What is the success of dynamic or sensate flap in reconstruction of the lip? Sensate flap for the lip? Yeah, dynamic flap. I think you are talking about the sling flap, no sir? Well, dynamic flaps are okay if you use a Palmaris. At least in the patients that I've done, see the lower lip just has to behave like a vertical dam. The height has to be maintained, and the upper lip can purse. The person can purse his lips and close the mouth. so you have to be able to have adequate lower lip height if that is maintained by the sling then the oral competence is quite okay and all the patients that i have done uh, total lips there they are quite okay they are able to use the the lower lip as just a physical dam you know says the vertical dam where the upper lip uh, um, rests on the the good question that they asked the other part of the question that they've asked is sensate flaps theoretically you can do a sensate flap uh, 
because you have the median and lateral antebrachial cutaneous nerves in the forearm and uh, they can be anastomosed to the branches of the mental nerve that are exiting the mental foramen the mental nerve has three branches uh, to the lip uh, to the vestibule uh, so you have uh, the branch that goes to the lip you can identify that and you can still suture the medial or lateral antebrachial cutaneous nerves which can be harvested as part of the radial forearm flap and anastomose. I've never done it. So in theory, it is possible to uh, do a sensate flap deconstruction also. Because I think having a sensate lower lip is also important because temperature perception is important uh, for patients also. But I think in due course of time, uh, uh, you know, the sensory nerves do grow in from the surrounding tissues and the lip regains some sensation afterwards. But uh, talking about the uh, dynamic thing for uh, lip reconstruction, uh, um, the radial forearm with a palmaris or a facial artery sling is the best uh, way to do it. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question is very really interesting. Uh, uh, if microstoma in carapendix cannot be prevented, uh, should we consider free flap or should we go ahead and repair with the carapendix and repair microstoma at a later date? It's very difficult to repair microstoma at a later date because patient will go for radiation, patient will be, it's a functionally very crippling condition to have. It's not very easy. So uh, the problem with lip reconstruction is what you see on table, it, it will get worse. It's not going to get better. So you probably do a Webster burnout by borrowing tissue from the cheek or you just do a free flap and because carapandic just results in a, a unbearable microstoma at times. So, I mean, people have done stretching and vision of the commissure and advancement of skin and buccal mucosa. All that is fine. But the moment you do that, you lose competence uh, com uh, competence of the commissure. So, you're, you're going into another problem after that. So, if the defect is too long, the carapandic uh, is better to avoid. It's, it's okay to do a free flap with a sling than do a carapandic, I think. Sir, again, on the context of uh, the construction, Dr. Deepmala has a question that how many months do you wait after RT to take a patient uh, for the second revision you know, or reconstruction? Take, uh, the effects, the delayed effects of radiation um, uh, are there till two years after the radiation has been given. So radiation has, you know, primary effects, secondary effects, the tertiary effects of radiation can last for up to two years. And uh, you also have to see the dose of the radiation and what was the hot spot of the radiation. Because if you try to do something and if the wound breaks down, you're in a lot of trouble. Unless you import fresh tissue, you will not be able to reconstruct the defect. So wait for two years. Uh, the earliest is a year, one year. If you can, please wait for two years uh, before you plan for the revision procedures. Okay, sir. Uh, the good question is that what is the best approach for reconstruction for recurrent diseases of lower lip by Dr. Jimmy? Uh, recurrent disease as in um, you've already done a flap reconstruction or uh, so he let, hasn't let, mentioned but I think uh, that make yeah, recurrence I, I, is, uh, I think the, if you have a recurrent disease you again look at the defect and decide what you need to do there's no specific uh, so if the patient is already exhausted his local flap options. He's had a primary uh, reconstruction, primary uh, tumor that was excised and he's had an abbe or he's had a eslander or he's had a gilly and he's having further loss of uh, lip substance. And if he can maintain the minimum 9 to 10 centimeters of lip stock and if the labial artery is still intact, then you can think of doing an abbe or an eslander. But if an abbe or eslander has already been done, then it's quite difficult to use uh, a local flap from the upper lip, then you can think of doing an advancement from the cheek or advancement from the mentum. That is option number two. But in most cases, a recurrent tumor uh, margins are more ill-defined. The defects are slightly larger. The defects don't yield because of scarring and fibrosis. So would uh, probably in the end end up with a free flap, I think. Okay, thank you, sir. Another question by Dr. Suresh is that uh, in case of a lid reconstruction, what is the suture number you use? Uh, he's asking about 6-0 material. Sorry? Uh, which in case of a lid, Dr. Yeah, Suresh? 6-0 is fine. Okay, if you have a spatulated needle, 6-0 is fine. 
the next question is by Dr. Abhimanyu. In which plane to tunnel the sling in remnant upper and lower limb? And should the ends be secured externally? Uh, no, you just have to secure it to the orbicularis. So you'll have to make stab incisions on both upper and lower lips. Then you'll have to dissect between the skin and the, the mucosa and the underlying muscle so that you don't damage the vascular pedicle on the, on the deeper aspect. Then you tunnel under the, uh, the skin and the mucosal surface, bring the sling and suture the sling with a figure of eight onto the underlying muscle. So the sling is attached to the muscle rather than the skin. And then you close the skin with a bicral suture or a proline that you want to remove. But try to preserve the, don't disrupt the upper lip uh, orbicularis continuity. Don't go deep to the upper lip orbicularis because you will damage the vascularity. Stay above it. But uh, just bring the, the, the facial artery or the palmaris and then um, suture it to the muscle in a figure of eight. And it should be sutured quite tightly. So don't make it a lax suture. So again, the next question is by Dr. Deepmala. Would you consider MSAP with plantar sling as an alternative to uh, radial flap, uh, FRAF with PLC? See, uh, the MSAP is a perforator-based flap. It's not a septocutaneous flap or it's not as vascular as a radial forearm flap. See, the uh, you can. I mean, you can basically use any thin flap. You can use MSAP or the patient is very thin, you can still use a ALT flap also with a facial ATA sling, as long as the perforator is away from the sling. But my contention has always been that in a radial forearm flap, you still have parts of the pedicle that are attached to the skin, proximal and distal to the palmaris tendon. So even if there is compression of the, of the uh, dermal blood supply, because of the septocutaneous you know, attachments, I wouldn't say septocutaneous, the word I would use is the radial forearm has got a very long segment where it gives feeder vessels into the, uh, to the skin. So if you make a small opening and you know, tunnel the palmaris, you're still having intact connection between the vascular pedicle on the uh, proximal aspect of the flap as well as the distal aspect of the flap. So even if the area of the, uh, of the sling is tight, the dermal circulation is not affected because you have blood supply from intact connections on both sides. So I'm not sure how it would work in MSAP. I've done ALT for a lip where the perforator was on the outside, the, the skin aspect, and it worked fine. But it is possible. I don't see any reason why you cannot do it. But again, MSAP, you have to, pedicle length is only six to eight millimeters. Uh, you might not get enough. Uh, you have to see MSAP is good to take if you're going to close the donor side primarily. So nothing more than six or eight centimeters width you can take. So if you have to create a vertical dam of lower lip, you have to create a vertical height in the lower lip, you might need slightly more. So it is possible, but the more reliable alternative would be to use a uh, radial forearm or ALT. Okay, sir. As of now, uh, that's the end of the, all the questions are there, sir. Okay. And uh, I thank you very much, sir, for giving this presentation. Okay. And uh, I just wanted to mention to everyone that there is a next presentation in the coming Wednesday, which I will be putting up uh, in the groups as well as on the Facebook. So with that, Mark, I would like to conclude it. So do you want to say anything? Um, nothing. I mean, um, um, the, the, the lid and lip reconstruction, um, it, you know, you, it's a lot about uh, local flaps. It's not about uh, free flaps that we use. So it takes some time to learn planning and to learn the execution. So it's only drawing and understanding the incisions and understanding how to respect the incisions. And uh, uh, this is probably the two areas where local flaps outweigh uh, free flaps any day. So I hope that you find uh, more interesting material to read and uh, sort of get uh, more interested in lid and um, lip reconstruction. So we will take leave, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you all for attending and uh, uh, I'll see you next week again. Thank you.